We're more than halfway through the NASCAR regular season, and there are a lot of big, big names right there on that playoff cut line, right on the bubble. And in fact, there's a couple very big names that are actually on the outside looking in right now. Let's look at the playoff standings today and talk about who's in trouble. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. Lots of episodes this week, I know, but this is one that I actually wanted to do last week when we were uh, 13 races into the regular season. Right at that halfway point, I wanted to talk about the playoff standings, look at who's where and who's in trouble, who's not. Uh, but I had to delay it a week, but better late than never. We're talking about the playoff standings today because I think it's officially starting to get into that time now where it's the final home stretch, hitting those hot summer months, going to go to a wide variety of racetracks the next few weeks. Uh, the playoff grid is starting to take form. We're starting to really see who the contenders are, who the pretenders are, who's in trouble, and I think these next few weeks could be huge for a lot of these drivers, especially right there on that playoff bubble. Some of these drivers are in contract here, some of these drivers are trying to keep sponsors, so there's a lot of pressure on a lot of these drivers, and so uh, I want to talk about that today. It should be pretty interesting. A couple news and notes really quick before we get started. Yesterday I made a video talking about Christopher Bell uh, and his potential future, where he could land in the Cup Series. I mentioned Stuart Haas Racing with Clint Boyer reportedly being in a contract year on an expiring contract uh the 14 car could be a very real possibility for christopher bell but then yesterday after i uploaded that episode adam stern reported a whole bunch of other contract deals with Stuart haas that could be up at the end of this year daniel suarez while he did sign a multi-year contract with Stuart haas racing it gives Stuart haas the option to extend suarez so theoretically if they don't pick up his option suarez might also be a free agent again this offseason and the other bit that i didn't actually know is that smithfield foods their contract with shr is ending after this year as well they've been very loyal to Eric Almarola for years, and they finally had some pretty good success since he's gotten to this 10 car. You'd think they would extend their partnership for a couple more years, perhaps, but uh, that has not been done yet, and it's unclear whether or not talks around that have happened. So, uh, yeah, there's maybe some more changes than we initially expected that could take place over at SHR. If you ask me, I do not think they will have the exact same four drivers here in 2020. Harvick's safe, but out of Almarola, Suarez, Boyer, I'll bet two of them will stay. I'll bet two of them stay put, but I'll bet one of them probably ends up uh, leaving. But uh, we'll have to wait and see which one that ends up being. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Another bit of news I noticed this afternoon before I hit record. Uh, Brian France, remember that? Jolly old man. The former CEO of NASCAR who, to put it lightly, has not done a very good job representing the sport. At the end of last summer, he was arrested on DUI and drug charges. And since then, he has really not been involved in NASCAR in any capacity. Uh, Jim France has been the interim CEO. Now they've removed the interim tag. He is the CEO of NASCAR right now. Brian France has basically been erased from the picture in almost every sense of the word. According to Bob Pockers from Fox Sports on Twitter, he has some updates on Brian France's whole court situation. He says Brian France was in court today and has reached a plea agreement with prosecutors in New York. He pleaded guilty to DWI, where if he adheres to conditions, counseling and community service, and no additional violations, charges will be reduced to a non-criminal traffic violation. In another tweet, he said France uh, is going to have to perform 100 hours of community service. Uh, but yeah, so this is interesting. I don't think this means a whole lot if you're purely a NASCAR fan. Uh, I don't think Brian France is coming back to head this ship anytime soon. The France family obviously still has the m most of the control in NASCAR, uh, but it seems to me at least uh, that ever since his issue last summer, Brian France has not been involved in many, if any, of the de decisions. Uh, Brian France, I think, has effectively been cut out of the deal, cut out of the picture uh, when it comes to representing NASCAR, working around NASCAR. So uh, even if this doesn't turn into a criminal charge, and say what you will, uh, I don't think Brian France is coming back anytime soon. Let me put it that way. He's not coming back. I've said that since the very beginning when he was initially arrested, that he was going to be cut out and wasn't going to come back. And so far that's held true. I don't think Brian France is going to be the CEO of NASCAR ever again. But in case any of you guys were reading those reports and starting to raise questions like, oh God, is he coming back? Is he avoiding jail? Oh no. I don't think he's coming back. I think it would be a really bad look for NASCAR publicly if they brought Brian France back. It would just, the media would kill them for that. It'd be a really bad look. He doesn't deserve to come back and be the face, the head of the sport again, and I don't think any fan really wants him to come back, so I just want to leave it at that. Uh, let's talk, though, now about the main thing I want to discuss in this episode, the playoffs. We haven't really looked at the playoff grid on this show at all. Every week I talk about the top finishers in each race, I talk about who's on a roll, who's not, uh, but now we're actually going to step back and look at the point standings as of now. Well, the playoff grid specifically. We're going to factor in wins and everything, so if the playoffs started today, here would be the top 16. Well, actually, we have the top 24 listed here, uh, but you can see the top 16 obviously make the playoffs. You see got Kyle Busch at the top of the board there with four wins, uh, a couple guys with three wins. Uh, there you go. Kyle Busch, Brad Keselowski, Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin, Chase. Guys with wins are virtually locked in as is. Kevin Harvick with that huge points cushion, he's locked in in my opinion. I would even say the same for Kurt Busch. I know Kurt Busch is driving for a less successful team, but 
Uh, he's been so good this year. He's got a big enough cushion. I think Kurt Busch is all but locked in. Guys who I think should be feeling okay, you know, Ryan Blaney, Clint Boyer, Alex Bowman, Eric Almarola, they're they should be feeling pretty pretty good about where they're at right now. They have a uh, significant, they have pretty much at least a full race worth of points cushion over the cutoff line. Uh, I know Alex Bowman started this year off really uh, poorly. At one point, he was 21st in points uh, going into the Easter you know, week off. And then just in the last five or six races since then, dude has rocketed from 21st to 11th in points. That's what those three second place finishes in a row will do for you. Assuming they keep any semblance of momentum, I think they are just fine. Then we look up here, 13th through you know the rest are, uh, they're the ones that have maybe a fire lit under them a little bit. And so here's what I want to do in today's episode. I want to play a little bit of a game. It's not a very clever game. It's really not a game at all. I'm playing a game by myself, uh, and it doesn't even really have a very exciting title. I call it Comfy or Concerned. And in other words, I'm going to look at a lot of these drivers near the playoff bubble, and I'm going to tell you guys whether or not they should be feeling pretty comfy about where they're at, uh, or how concerned they should be about their current situation. Because anytime you're on the playoff bubble, you got a lot of pressure behind you. So, uh, that's what we're going to do here. Last look at the full playoff grid before I do this here. Uh, yeah, Daniel Suarez up there in 13th. Not bad, given he's missed the playoffs two years in a row. William Byron, we'll talk about him uh, in his second year, trying to make the playoffs against all the odds. Jimmy Johnson, the one Hendrick driver not in the playoffs currently. I know he's tied with Larson technically, but I think he loses that tiebreaker. The one Hendrick driver not currently locked in the playoffs is Jimmy Johnson. And I, I shouldn't say locked in the playoffs. The, the, one play, the one Hendrick driver not in the playoffs currently is Jimmy Johnson. That is insane. If you had told me that three years ago when he was still you know, polishing off his seventh championship run, uh, I would have been shocked. I know he's got a rookie crew chief. You know, we'll talk about that all in a moment here. Let's start. Comfy or concerned? Let's see uh, how nervous all these drivers should be. We'll start with Daniel Suarez, their 13th in points. Comfy or concerned? I think he should be a bit concerned. Uh, he has missed the playoffs in each of his first two full-time seasons in the Cup Series. And both those years with Joe Gibbs Racing, he's driving good equipment. Equipment that should be capable of making the playoffs. Uh, there's already some pressure, I think, behind Suarez, given he has not won a race yet in his career. Again, driving for Gibbs equipment and now SHR equipment. Uh, but that being said, it's his third year. We just talked about a minute ago how he could be potentially racing for his career this season uh, if Stuart Haas Racing doesn't opt to extend him this offseason, or pick up his option, I should say. Daniel Suarez has to make the playoffs this year. I think he's gone. He put all his chips in. He needs to make the playoffs this year. I know he's got an okay cushion there. He's probably not going to throw all that away in one race, uh, but he needs more performances like we saw us last weekend at Pocono, where he ran eighth, or Texas earlier this year, where he ran third. We know Daniel Suarez is capable of running top five, running top ten at a variety of racetracks, but he's not doing it consistently. I really like Daniel Suarez. I think he has a future in NASCAR, but he also has a lot of naysayers out there. A lot of people don't think he deserves that 41 car after his struggles at Joe Gibbs Racing. This is Suarez's year to prove them all wrong. Make the playoffs, contend for wins from time to time, and you'll silence some of those critics, at least for the short time being. Not only that, but you will likely keep your career moving on the right path, because if you don't if you struggle, if Suarez fades and misses the playoffs this year, uh, there's a very good chance he will not be with SHR in the next year or two, and that could be bad news for his future NASCAR career. So there is, he should be very concerned, not because he's in necessarily a bad spot here. He's 13th in points, not bad, but he needs to make the playoffs. There is pressure there, unlike that of on most other drivers. Let's move on to William Byron, 14th in points. Comfy or concerned? I actually think Byron should be feeling pretty good, fairly comfy. Obviously, he's near the bubble. He wants to make the playoffs, and that would be great for him, his team, his sponsors, and everything. But given where William Byron was a year ago, a rookie who really was lucky to break into the top 20 in a given week, the fact that he is now not only winning polls, as he's done this year, but also running for top 10s and actually kind of being there at the end, and he had that breakthrough race in the All-Star Race Open. That was fun to watch, had that great finish. Uh, I think Chad Knauss as a crew chief has made a world of difference for Byron this year. They've really figured out how to run well Friday and Saturday, qualify well, uh, get good starting spots, and they're starting to learn how to put together a full race, which is, I think, what Knauss is really helping with. I say William Byron is comfy because, I'll be honest, even if he fades and maybe misses the playoffs this year, I don't think it's going to be held against him too strongly. Remember, that 24 he's driving was the 5 that Casey Kane used to drive. And even during Hendrick's good years, 2016, 2017, Casey Kane was usually the back of the pack there. So he's driving arguably the worst equipment at Hendrick right now. I think you can make an argument Jimmy's running. It's been rumored that Jimmy Johnson's running actual test cars and stuff over there. So maybe Jimmy's got the worst equipment. But Byron is definitely not running the best cars. Uh, so for him to just be in playoff contention here halfway through the regular season, I mean, he's basically jumped up like 10 spots in points. I think last year he was like 21st or 22nd in points all year. He's up to 14th this year. That's a huge jump. So he should be feeling good about the jump he's made this year. It'd be nice if he makes the playoffs, but I don't think his career is depending on it, if you know what I mean. At least not this year. Let's talk about Eric Jones there, 15th in points. Comfy or concerned? I think Eric Jones should be pretty darn concerned. 
Now, I don't think a lot of his finishes this year really are indicative of how well that team has run. I think they've had some bad luck, some things beyond their controls, like that blown tire on lap 10 at the Coke 600. That was obviously a JGR issue, not an Eric Jones issue, and that killed him in the points. But when they avoid making mistakes as a team, not just Jones, but as a team, they're capable of running top five every week. Pocono last weekend, they ran third. We saw it at the end of last season in the playoffs. I know they were eliminated early because of a wreck that wasn't their fault. Uh, but then they ran off a streak of like six or so straight top tens. And had they not wrecked out of that first round, they would have made it to the round of eight according to the points. So Eric Jones finished last year strong, and I think he showed just a glimpse at the bright future he has. I think he is a future many-time race winner. I think he's a championship contender for many years to come. Uh, and I think right now the team is not doing him any favors. And I think the reason he should be concerned, though, is there is pressure behind him. With Christopher Bell down the minor leagues, the talk suggests that Jones is going to stay with Gibbs. They're going to extend him this offseason. Uh, but say something happens, say they go the other way, say they can't come to terms, Jones might very well as well be racing for his career in a sense. If he wants to stay in good equipment, whether it be with Gibbs or another team, he needs to perform this year. And I think he needs to make the playoffs, definitely, and needs to contend for wins. And when they don't make mistakes, they do that. But they need to avoid the mistakes, and that's easier said than done. And the other big reason he should be concerned is you look at his other Joe Gibbs racing teammates, they all have multiple wins. I think that puts a lot of extra pressure on Eric Jones. They're clearly the fourth team at, G at Gibbs right now, and that can't feel very good. Kyle Larson, right there on the bubble. He's tied with Jimmy Johnson. I think Larson has the tiebreaker, though, so he would get the last spot as of now. Uh, but come for your concerned, also concerned easily if you're Kyle Larson. Two years ago, we were talking about him being a championship contender. Now here he is mm, right on that playoff bubble line. I'm honestly not sure if Kyle Larson's full focus is even on NASCAR right now. I mean, just this week, he's gone to race several dirt events. He's won a couple of them. I saw a video of him flipping, though, last night, so... He's racing all sorts of cars, all sorts of series. I just think for the time being, maybe for the summer months, it would really be beneficial to him if he was able to focus in on NASCAR because they've had mistakes this year that weren't Larson's fault, but they've also had mistakes like at Pocono last week that kind of were Larson's fault that have killed them in the points. The fact that Kurt Busch is coming to Ganassi equipment and just outperformed Larson pretty much week in, week out is concerning to, about Kyle Larson. I, I think Kyle Larson's a great driver. I think he's a future champion in NASCAR. But Kurt Busch has just come in and made him look like a rookie again. I thought Kurt Busch would come into Chip Ganassi and elevate both those teams, and they'd both be top 10, top 5 contenders, perhaps. But no, Kurt Busch is up there running for top 5s each week, and Larson's on the record half the time. Much like Eric Jones, Larson and that team need to avoid the mistakes. If they avoid the mistakes, we saw it at Atlanta earlier this year. They had a great car, were contending for the win, led a lot of laps. Charlotte, they obviously won the All-Star race, so this team can win races. They're not a completely off team right now. Chevy's obviously kind of rebounded a little bit from last year, so they should be running better. They should be finishing better, especially. And we even saw Pocono last week. They won two stages and then made a mistake and cost them max points, you know? So they need to eliminate, eliminate the mistakes because the cars are good enough. The cars are good enough for them to run top five, top 10 every week like Kurt Busch is doing, but Kurt Busch with that veteran experience isn't making the same mistakes Larson's making. And that's what's killing this team right now. So definitely concerned. Larson, you know, he's supposed to be a future superstar in this sport. And his time's supposed to be, like, right around the corner. So if he misses the playoffs this year, that'd be a big blow to his, uh, his future legacy, I think. And now you want to talk about legacy. Jimmy Johnson right now, 17th in points technically. He's tied with Larson. Uh, come for your concern. Concerned. Oh my goodness, red flags all over the place. I said a minute ago, two and a half years, he was winning his record-tying 7th NASCAR Cup Series championship. Where has the time gone? What happened to Jimmy Johnson? He looks the same. He still looks like he's in good shape. I know he's in good shape. He just ran a marathon for Pete's sake. I would say it's all the crew chief. He's working with a rookie crew chief this year, Kevin Mendering. Uh, but Jimmy struggled last year with Chad Knauss too. So I don't think it's all on Kevin. Although I don't think he's helping Jimmy Johnson very much. Now at the beginning of this year, in February, I told you guys that I thought Jimmy Johnson would miss the playoffs this year. Mainly for the reasons we've seen all year. Jimmy Johnson is clearly not quite as focused as he once was, and now he's working with a rookie crew chief who does not have, uh, at least coming into this year, did not have any Cup Series experience, so I figured that would be the perfect storm, and Jimmy would actually miss the playoffs this year. And right now, I'm honestly a little surprised I'm feeling, I'm, I'm looking so correct about this right now. Even when I said that, in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, that's Jimmy Johnson, man. I shouldn't be doubting Jimmy Johnson, but here we are, more than halfway through the regular season. He's plopped himself down there in 17th place. Now, I think things look good for him going forward. The Hendrick cars seem to have found some speed the last few weeks, so I tend to think he'll start to translate that speed into slightly better finishes and might make his way into the top 16. But you look at the guys he has to beat. You look at the guys ahead of him. Eric Jones, driving for Gibbs equipment. I don't know if he's beating Eric Jones. Kyle Larson, guy we think could be a future superstar. I don't know if he's beating Kyle Larson. There are a lot of good cars and good drivers ahead of him in the points that he's going to have to beat these last you know 12, 12 weeks. And I don't know, as much faith as I have in Jimmy Johnson, I just don't know if that's possible. I think Jimmy Johnson should definitely be concerned uh, because if he misses the playoffs this year, 
it could seriously damage, damage his legacy, to be quite honest with you. Two, three years ago, we were all actively discussing whether or not Jimmy Johnson was the best driver in NASCAR history. For years, it's been Richard Petty, Dale Earnhardt's name comes out there, you know, David Pearson, Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart. There's a few names that are thrown out there. But for, you know, two, three years ago, many people, myself included, for maybe a day, had Jimmy Johnson at number one. But now he's only won three races in the last two and a half years. Uh, he wasn't a contender last year, and it doesn't look like he's a contender this year. If he misses the playoffs in this era where they let 16 drivers and teams in, it would not be a good look. I think at this point right now, fans are probably falling back in love with Richard Petty. I think now if you ask fans who's the best driver in NASCAR history, the vast majority would say Richard Petty. But again, I'm telling you guys, two, three years ago, it would have been probably split, to be quite honest. So that's why I say Jimmy Johnson should be concerned. Every major sports figure, whether they say it or not, cares about their legacy. They want to be remembered as the greatest. And for a brief period there, we thought Jimmy was. And since that period, he's done nothing but kind of decline. So uh, I think Jimmy Johnson needs to make the playoffs. Uh, and if he doesn't, it would be shocking to say the least. 18th in points, Ryan Newman. Comfy or concerned? I'll be honest, I know these last few guys have been concerned, but I think Ryan Newman should be feeling pretty good. He should be comfy. I know he'd love to sneak back into the playoffs, but given where that six car and where Roush Fenway was the last couple of years, the fact that he's been right there knocking on the door of a playoff spot this year, that's a big win for him. Ryan Newman already has more top tens this year, three, than that six car had all of last season. Making the playoffs would be a huge bonus if for Ryan Newman, but I don't see it as a necessity. I don't think this is something where Ryan Newman's going to look at this season as a complete failure if they miss the playoffs. I don't think he should. Uh, that six car was irrelevant last year. Uh, when Matt Kenseth drove it, it looked a little better, but I still wouldn't have thought playoff team. Uh, but this year with Newman, I'm they're knocking on the door. I think he's taken this team a step further than I thought they'd get this year. And uh, at this point, I think even if he misses the playoffs by a spot or two, you'd be disappointed for sure. You want to make the playoffs, and when you're right there, it hurts if you don't get it. But I think Ryan Newman should be feeling pretty good about what he's done for that team this year. They've He's turned Roush Fenway into a respectable team again. That six car was not respectable until you know the last few races of last season, and Ryan Newman has taken that a step further and really made them look good from time to time. Paul Menard there in 19th, comfy or concerned? He must be comfy because it feels like every year he's sitting there like 20th in points. He likes being right around this spot in the standings. Uh, yeah, Paul Menard's you know, ever since he was half a lap away from winning the clash at the beginning of the season, we really haven't talked about Paul Menard. He's more he's more notable, I'd say, this year for those commercials he does with Ryan Blaney and the Sasquatch guy. I feel like that's, when I look back at 2019 and I think of Paul Menard, I'm going to think of that. He's consistent, I'll give him that. He only has one DNF this year, and it was the Daytona 500, so you can't really avoid that. Uh, but you look at the rest of the season, he only has two top 10s, and he doesn't have any top 5. So he's consistently just average, just mediocre. I know he's doing the best with that equipment. I don't think that equipment is championship level, but Ryan Blaney did make it to the round of eight in that 21 car a few years ago. Did we forget about that? Ryan Blaney did that. I feel like that should have gotten more more talk, more hype. Yeah, shoot, Ryan Blaney, I think, ran better in Wood Brothers equipment than Penske equipment. Can we talk? We should talk about that. I, I'll have to look at the stats, but now that I'm thinking about it, whoa. Nah, but needless to say, Paul Menard, uh, I mean, he's done fine this year. It, it just Paul Menard, what else? What is there to really say? I mean, just a couple more here. Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., 20th in points. Come for your concern. He should be concerned, at least a little bit. Stenhouse has really never reached his full potential, in my opinion. When we saw him in the Xfinity Series, uh, he was winning races, winning championships. Uh, he looked great. And I thought when uh, when Matt Kenseth left Roush and they put Stenhouse in the 17, I thought that was a good move. I thought Stenhouse would take a year or two, but could eventually be a contender. That's never happened. And I don't think it's all Stenhouse. I think that team, as obviously he joined Roush kind of right at the end of their good old days. And since he's been with them, they've kind of been on a downward spiral. So it's not all Stenhouse, but the fact that Newman showed up this year and is higher up in the points than him and, you know, it sometimes outrunning him doesn't make me feel great for Stenhouse. I think he should be a little concerned by that. I really hope he'd improve this year. Last year, I think he finished 18th in points, you know, just missed the playoffs. I thought this year with Newman coming over there, I thought that whole Roush team would be elevated slightly more. And Stenhouse has had his moments this year. I mean, he got his first ever top five at a mile and a half a few weeks ago. So he's had his moments. He's run well at times, but he isn't getting the finishes uh, like a wreck at Pocono at the end of last week's race. It's just like, man, salvage, a lot of these younger drivers need to learn to salvage their days. You know, Larson got put back in traffic last week or at Pocono and then ended up wrecking. Stenhouse gets put back in traffic, wrecks. And it's just like, I know it's not all, it's not all in their control sometimes, but when you're having a not so great day, it's all about salvaging it, getting the 15th place finish, just not wrecking the car. And Stenhouse has never really figured that out, I feel like. But yeah, I really thought he'd improve off of last season uh, and he really hasn't that much. I'd be surprised if he makes the playoffs. He's you know, not an insurmountable hole that he's in right now, but 
I don't know, I just wouldn't be feeling great. Last one I'm gonna talk about, and this is one that I'm really kind of just scratching my head about. Uh, last one, Austin Dillon. He's 21st in points right now. Come for your concern. I am extremely concerned with Austin Dillon. I don't know. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> he had some good runs this year. Started on the pole for a couple races. Auto Club, Talladega. Uh, he ran sixth, I think, at Richmond. He had some good runs earlier this year. At one point, I think just a couple weeks ago, he was 14th in points. And I was sitting there like, oh, there we go. He's pointing his way into the playoffs. He's taking a big step forward in his career. This is great. He's been consistent. And he's had a couple really bad races in a row. And now he finds himself not just outside the top 16, but he is in a hole. I don't think Austin Dillon comes back from this. He's going to need a win. I'm disappointed because at the beginning of this year, I told you guys, I said that I thought Austin Dillon would kind of emerge this year. He's technically the veteran at RCR now with Daniel Hemrick there as the other driver. Uh, so I thought he'd kind of emerge, become the leader of the organization. He finished last year pretty strong. I thought he'd take a step forward this year and would contend for a win here and there. More top tens, more top fives. I thought he'd point his way into the playoffs. You know, he made the playoffs in 2017 after that who had a lucky win at the Coke 600. He made the playoffs again in 2018 after knocking a guy out of the way to win the Daytona 500. So he's gotten those two wins, which are great, but not really. He hasn't. They're not your traditional wins. He has not dominated either of those races or performed exceptionally well at any track uh, on the schedule. So, But I thought this year would be the year he would be consistent. He would actually point his way into the playoffs and not have to rely on a fluke win somewhere. That's what I thought. And for the first 10 races or so this year, he was doing just that. Consistent finishes, pole, pole position starts here and there. Uh, was 14th in points, like I said, and feeling I was feeling pretty good about Austin Dillon. I was impressed, but all that's just falling off a cliff. And I don't know, I don't know if they come back from that. He wrecked at Pocono last week, and I know he kind of got into it with Menard. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Sometimes you can't control everything that happens to you, but man. It's just been bad thing after bad thing for the last month. But yeah, I really don't have a whole lot else to say there. But there you have it. Uh, once again, take a look at the top 24 in points right now as they stand. These are the only guys that I really think have a somewhat decent chance. I mean, I know Ty Dillon, Daniel Hemrick, pretty far out of it. Uh, but Ty Dillon's won some stages. He can win a race. You never know. Daniel Hemrick is leading the Rookie of the Year points right now. So you never know what could happen over there. But uh, there you have it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. A lot of videos up this week. I'll be taking a couple days off until uh, after the Michigan race Sunday. But yeah, remember you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram. You can check out uh, down by the description uh, how you can get yourself an Out of the Group t-shirt. I don't have these t-shirts for sale yet with the newer alternate logo. YouTube's been really finicky with how they let you upload shirt designs. At least they have been for me. I don't know about for everybody else. So hopefully I can get you guys some more t-shirt designs very soon. Or maybe I'll find out another platform to sell them on because uh, I don't I like this new logo. I don't know about you guys. I like it. Shout out my Patreon supporters. Michael Harrison at you as the stars, mentally defective Cameron James, John Coblin, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Dennison, Mika Suzuki, iFantasyRace.com, TheRacingInsiders.com, Matthew Koulopoulos, Adam Lean, Peppy Luscious, and the rest of these awesome supporters. Thank you guys so, so much for continuing to support me, support the show. Uh, none of this would be possible without the help I get from you guys, so thank you so much for your extra support. Yep, like I said, new video will be up after Michigan. I have some other fun things planned in the not-so-distant future. Hopefully we get another uh, couple driver appearances not too far down the line. Uh, also have some other kind of maybe NASCAR related videos but kind of different videos that I want to work on uh, this summer when I have some extra time so we'll see if those come to fruition I don't want to just want to plant that seed plant that little tease down right now uh, but yeah hope you guys enjoyed this episode thank you as always for watching and I'll see you guys again very very soon bye bye y'all